So I remember um, when I was, I think it was probably late second grade, maybe uh, third grade. Well, let me back up a little bit. When I was born, my parents were living in the Medford area. And then around uh, after my first grade year, we moved up to this little town of Powers. And I'm sure there are some people here, I think, had asked during a previous sermon how many people knew where Powers was. But mom's nightmare about Powers was that Powers, that Powers was so small, so remote, that she, her nightmare was that the roads would wash out on either side of town and we'd be stuck there. And she never fully unpacked when we were there. We were only there just a few months and the house that we were living in was this rickety two-story house that I don't even know if it even exists anymore. It kind of sway a little bit in the wind uh, when the winds picked up. And then we moved into Myrtle Point. And ultimately, we moved, so right around, I think, just before my third grade year, uh, Dad moved us out onto these five acres of property between Myrtle Point and Coquille. And I think Dad had some, a number of reasons uh, for moving us out there. I think part of it was Dad wanted to expose us to the country life. Uh, we were in a double wide mobile home in the middle of five acres and dad purchased four calves and only one of them survived till adulthood. His name was Ronald McDonald and he was, you know, a steer. He was trying to, dad was trying to teach us something, I think, about what it was like to live like that. And we had this pulsating electric fence around our garden because the steer kept getting into the garden. And it was one that was designed at least for like three or four times the distance that we had around there. So I had a lot of power on there. And we had a lot of space to run and play. And we, uh, but one of the things I discovered in uh, the, what was it, a year, a little more, a year and a half maybe, uh, two years, we weren't on that property very long. Three years, mom says, um, Anyway, at the time that we were on that property, one of the things I discovered is that while I'm a small town guy, I am definitely not country. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy all of the smells that were associated with the country life, the mess that associated with country life. I had, um, years later, I, in order to raise money to go on missions trips, I cleaned out horse stalls and things like that. I've decided, I've decided that's not for me. I am decidedly not country. I will not own goats or sheep or chickens or cows or horses. Give me a cat, give me a dog, I'm okay with that. Keep it simple. In the, since the beginning of the year, we've been in this sermon series on the family of believers talking about the characteristics of a healthy family and how some of those characteristics of a healthy family apply as well to the family of believers. We have seen the family identity, what the family identity looks like. We've looked at family membership out of John 3 and what it's like to become. How do we become members of the family of believers? We looked at the difficult topic of family discipline and how God disciplines us as his children. And then we looked at this double-sided coin of family leadership and family followership, each one of these characteristics are absolutely important and vital for us to understand if we are to grow as a family of believers. This week, we turn our attention to another aspect of the family, and that is family responsibilities. Now, in living, on the five acres of property. One of the things that I discovered as well is that there are certain responsibilities that even kids have in a family. We have chores, certain things that we need to get done. 
And this morning, we will see that in the family of believers, we also have certain family responsibilities. So turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll be reading the entire chapter this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of, of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. We are all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become, more, become much more presentable, whereas those more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that, member, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed the church in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All are not gifts of healings. No, all do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open up your word. I pray that you would help us to understand as believers what our responsibilities are to the family. The reality that you have given us gifts. You have given us things that you have entrusted us with. And your expectation, God, is that we would use those. So Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes to understand what your word has for us this morning, reminding us that your word is perfect, your word is infallible, and your word is able to equip us for every good work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we get into the text this morning, I want to make a clarifying statement right up front, and that is that when I speak of the term family responsibilities this morning, I'm using it interchangeably with the term spiritual gifts. So when you hear me say spiritual gifts, I'm referring to family responsibilities. When you hear me say family responsibilities, I'm referring to spiritual gifts. I believe that this text this morning helps us to understand that members of the family have the responsibility to use their spirit-given abilities or gifts for the benefit of the family. You've been given something. Each one of us, as we'll find out this morning, has been given something, and we have that responsibility to use it for the benefit of the family. As Paul opens up the chapter this morning, he starts by telling us that he does not want us to be unaware of what is involved with these spiritual gifts. For whatever is happening with the Corinthian church, and as I've mentioned before, the Corinthian church is likely his most dysfunctional church. For whatever else was going on, among the various reasons why Paul writes this letter is to correct an error when it comes to what their responsibilities were to one another, their spiritual gifts. These, they had become people who were ignorant of what they'd been given, and error had creeped into the church. Now, before Paul had been, had before Paul even gets into what the specific error is, he notes that family responsibilities are founded in a right relationship with Jesus. These believers had time, had that these believers had at one time not been a part of the family of believers. It's a pretty obvious statement. Paul says, "You were pagans. You were led astray by false idols." They had been deceived at one point. However, they, were, they now had a new confession. They had something that brought them into the family of believers. The culture around them is, through, the word, through their words and deeds, saying Jesus is accursed. And... Paul is saying that no one by the power of the Holy Spirit can say Jesus is accursed. The culture had rejected Jesus. The culture has no room for Jesus because Jesus compels something from them. In all actuality, Jesus compels everything from them and from us. Those who find the Jesus of the Scriptures the Christ whom Paul preached to be offensive cannot do so by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Paul reminds us of this. In contrast, those who embrace the Jesus of the Scriptures are those who are willing to give everything for Him and to give everything to Him, and they cannot do that on their own. Those who live lives that have been transformed by a right relationship with Jesus are those who can confess that Jesus is Lord. This was one of the early confessions of the church. It wasn't Caesar. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has command over our lives. 
And that can only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Before we can ever begin a conversation about what our responsibilities are as family members in the family of believers, we must first make sure that we have a proper relationship with Jesus. Family responsibilities are founded in a right relationship with Jesus. This morning, can you confess that Jesus is Lord while understanding what this requires of you? It compels something of you. It compels everything from you. If so, then you understand that the Holy Spirit is present and is working in your life. And you are in a position to understand what your responsibilities are to the family that you are a part of. As we find our association with the family of believers confirmed through our confession that Jesus is Lord and through the enabling of the Holy Spirit, we also discover that family responsibilities are founded in the working of the Holy Spirit. As we develop and increased awareness and appreciation of our family responsibilities or our spiritual gifts, we realize a couple of things. The first is that Paul tells us there are varieties of gifts. There are varieties of ministries. There are varieties of effects. So we understand that each responsibility differs. Each one of us has been entrusted with something. And we've been entrusted with something that someone else has not been given. We may, this may be the result of your upbringing. You have different background than somebody else. This may be the result of your experiences, both positive and negative. This may be your distinct personality or certain things that you find particularly fascinating. I know Bill likes track. He likes shot put. God has opened up doors through that. Different levels of interest. Regardless, each one here has been given something that none of the rest of us possess. I would imagine that even Ellie and Eli, as little identical twins, not identical twins, but as twins, have already begun to develop their own unique personalities. They are going to be very different growing up. They're going to share the same experiences, but they're going to develop in very different ways. Being different is not in and of itself a bad thing. At a fundamental level, differences exist, and each one of us has been entrusted with different gifts. Each one of us will exercise perhaps even similar gifts in differing ways. Each one of us will have differing ministries. How we take what we've been given and put them to use is going to vary from person to person and from time to time. I, as a pastor, have a similar calling and set of responsibilities that Bart and Troy have. However, the context in which I serve is different from the context that they serve, even though all three of us serve in a similar community. Carrie and Cheryl, you may have similar interests that have brought you together. But the way that you engage in those interests are very different because you have very different backgrounds. The service we engage in is going to look different, perhaps even within the same body of believers. And our varying ministries are okay. It's okay to have differing ministries, even within the same family. 
Not only are the gifts and the service going to look different from person to person and context to context, but the results of them are going to look very different as well. It's so tempting for us to take a look at one church and see what they are doing and think, if we did that, then we could experience the results that they're experiencing. If we did what they do, we would get what they've gotten. I know Karen and I have had conversations about teachers and classrooms, and there seems to be this mindset that if you put kid A into system B, you'll get outcome C. The problem is there's, a, there's other variables in that. One of the biggest variables is the kid, and then the variable of the teacher. You can have differing, because we have differing gifts and differing ministries, we should expect differing results. Paul tells us there, there are varieties of gifts, there are varieties of ministries, and there are varieties of effects. A plus B always equals C, assuming A and B are the same in every context. But the problem is, they're not. They vary. The impact we are called to have is here, and we need to be comfortable with the idea that the results of the gifts and the ministries that we have are going to be different. Paul also reminds us that the source of our ministry, the source of our responsibilities is the same. We are not the source of our gifts, our ministries, or the results of our ministries. While these things differ, the source of our responsibilities is the same. Paul tells us, that these varieties, that there are varieties of these things, but the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God who works all things in all persons. In verse 11, he says, But one and the same Spirit work all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. We must be people who are yielded to the Spirit, who are moved by the Spirit, who are empowered by the Spirit. It is the Spirit who works. I think, it, I think that quite often we think too much of ourselves and our, spirit, and our gifts and not enough of the Spirit's work in us. The word used for gifts relates to the word grace. These are quite literally grace things. These are good things that we have received from the Spirit and the working of the Spirit in our lives. They are also referred to in verse 7 as manifestations of the Spirit or revealings, revelations of the Spirit. These are tangible ways in which the Holy Spirit has chosen to reveal himself in our midst. These are ways in which we use our gifts and engage in service in the family of believers, and they are visible demonstrations that the Holy Spirit is at work in our family. We are not the source of our responsibilities or gifts. Rather, God, the Holy Spirit, is. Now, I want to take a little bit of a side note to talk a bit about the specific gifts. Or rather, explain why I'm not going to talk about the specific gifts. There are, there are a couple of different reasons why I'm not going to take the time to talk about it. First of all, there's really no agreed-upon comprehensive list of what those spiritual gifts are. 
I was doing a little bit of research. I was tempted to take some spiritual needs assessments. And as I was doing some Google searching, I've discovered that some have as few as four spiritual gifts and some have as many as 22 spiritual gifts. So deciding on which to cover and which not to cover would be rather challenging because I would leave some out. Second, I think, and more importantly, is I don't think that's the point of Paul's passage. I think his point, while he references these gifts, his point is not what the gifts are specifically. Paul's point is rather the exercise of it. In 31 verses in this chapter, only six out of 31 even mention specifically spiritual gifts. These gifts are manifestations of the working of the Holy Spirit. They are distributed in varieties of ways for the common good of the family, the body of Christ. So to spend time in that, I think, if we had the time, we might spend it. It's not to say it's not important, but what is the major focus of the passage? And the focus of this context is the relationship between one another and the gifts. Not only are family responsibilities found in a right relationship with Jesus and found in the working of the Holy Spirit, but family responsibilities are focused on a right view of the body of Christ. In this passage, Paul uses the analogy of body parts as parts of the body to demonstrate how believers should exercise their responsibilities to one another. And he does so by, pre by presenting two common incorrect views and then by showing us what right looks like. The first incorrect view that he demonstrates that he gives us is this view that you have no need of me. This first view says that I'm insignificant. We see verses 15 and 16, if the foot says I am not a hand, I am not part, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it does not for this reason it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, it is not, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. One of the strong temptations in the family of believers is to think, simply because I do not possess a particular skill or ability that somebody else has, that you are not necessary. There is a feeling that you do not belong because you do not have or that you no longer have the ability to contribute in a way that others do. Perhaps this is a function of thinking, I'm too old or I'm too young or I'm too new here to be of any use. This view thinks too little of what God has given you. You think that simply because I don't possess gift X, Y, or Z, that you have nothing to contribute to the family. You are content to sit on the sideline watching the world go by. You are the young man in the parable of the talents who hid his one talent, bringing it out only when the master came to give an account for what his servants had been entrusted with. Each and every person here, if you have been saved, has been entrusted with gifts by the Holy Spirit. You are part of the body of Christ. And if you are part of the body of Christ, you have gifts 
you have something to contribute, whether you believe it or not. The second wrong view of the body of Christ says that I have no need of you. The first one says you have no need of me. This second one says I have no need of you. In verse 21, we see Paul telling us, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. The strong temptation here encompasses the view that if something needs to get done, then you alone are the one who needs to do it. Although it may be nice to have someone around, in some sense it kind of complicates things. There's a feeling that you belong, but they don't. They don't have what you have. They can't contribute what you can. They are a bother and not an asset. This view thinks too highly of what God has given you. It's this mindset that says, I'm indispensable. You think that God should be thankful that you decided to join the body. If the body is going to grow, it's because of your great and marvelous talents. You cannot step aside and let others help. The only way anything is ever going to get done is if you choose to do it. For those who are in the do-everything crowd... Let me remind you of what God tells us in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. We need one another. And that's the right view that Paul tells us. Verse 11 reminds us that each of us has received gifts from the Spirit where he distributes in verse 11 to each one just as he wills. Then at verse 12, Paul gives us the reason for even as the body is one and yet has many members of the body. Though they are many, they are one body. So also is Christ. Verse 14 says, For the body is one member, not many. The diverse nature of the family of believers does not preclude people from contributing to the family. Rather, it requires each one to participate the hand cannot function without the eye. The ear cannot go anywhere without the foot. Paul asks, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? If the body of Christ, the body of Christ is necessarily diverse. It requires different parts that operate in conjunction with one another in order to function. The family of believers is called to a unity of diverse parts and a diversity of unified parts. Practically speaking, we cannot all be the same. We should not strive to be the same. We should appreciate the differences that God has brought in our midst. We need people who think differently, who perceive things differently, who engage with others in different ways. 
we necessarily have to have diversity. All of these, of course, being exercised under the direction of the Holy Spirit. The reality is that every person is part of the family of believers. And those who are part of the family of believers have been given demonstrations of the Spirit's work. You've been given responsibilities to exercise. However, they are not for your own benefit. We are not, they are, they are not for our own personal enjoyment. Family responsibilities focus each one of us on the welfare of the body of Christ. Although we are quite diverse, even a small church like ours, we are not many individual, independently moving pieces. Rather, we are one functioning, one body functioning in concert with one another. Our text notes that those parts of the body that we seem to give the least consideration to are perhaps the ones that we treat with the greatest honor. I've probably told the story before, but one of my uh, favorite people at my ordination, at my ordaining church, was a gal by the name of Barbara Atzef. Barbara was in her 80s. She had a walker. She couldn't drive, so somebody would drop her off at the church. Somebody who didn't attend the church actually, actually would drop her off at the church. And she would come in with her walker, and she had this foam collar around her neck. I got to know Barbara in my time there. One time Barbara approached the elders of the church and asked them to put these mailboxes in the foyer of the church. And they had these mailbox slots there. The elders thought, hey, this is a great idea. It'll save us some money on mailing. Any communication that we need, we'll just make an announcement. You've got something in your mailbox there. Well, Barbara had other ideas. Barbara would take these old greeting cards and her hands were too shaky to write. So Barbara would take her typewriter and she would type encouraging notes. She would cut them out with scissors and she would glue them inside these cards. And with her shaky hand, she would sign them and put these cards in these boxes. People got to where they would go to check the mailbox, not to see if they got anything from the elders, but to see if they got a card from Barbara. Barbara passed away a few years ago, and unfortunately, I was unable to attend her funeral. But I can tell you that Barbara had a significant impact on that, on that congregation. From all external appearances, nobody would have taken notice of Barbara. If you would have brought in an outside consulting firm to do an assessment of the church, I don't know that they would have even brought up Barbara at all as a significant part of that ministry. Yet, Paul says, those members of the body which we deem to be weaker are necessary. Because every part contributes vitally to the unity of the whole. And we honor them. Why? Paul says, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. This word care means worry or deep concern. It can be used in a negative sense in the, in the New Testament, but here it's used for a deep care and concern for one another. Paul goes on to say, if one member suffers, then all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. There is a joy. When there's, if there's a joyous event in the family, each of us shares it. 
If there's grief and sorrow in the family, each of us feels it. If I stub my toe on the corner of the couch, my whole body reels in pain. If I take some aspirin for the pain, the rest of my body breathes a sigh of relief. We are all interconnected. We all individual we are all individually members of the body of Christ. Family, the family of believers, we are not many but one. And we must focus on the welfare of each other if we are to function in a healthy way. This is not the socialist, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The individual has value within the family of believers. The individual is to be honored and cherished no matter how insignificant they might appear to the outside world. However, the individual does not exist merely for his or her own benefit. The individual understands as much as they are able to that they must seek the welfare of other members of the family. You must take whatever you have been given and present it to God for Him to use for the building up of the family of believers, which is the body of Christ. I want to tell the story. This isn't in my notes, but I want to tell a story about another person up at Gladstone that made a huge impact on Karen and me. This is a young lady who was born with Down syndrome. And again, most people would kind of overlook her. Still lives with her parents, who were close friends of ours. But Kristen would come up every Sunday and greet us with this big smile on her, on her face. And I got to the point where I couldn't leave church until I'd gotten my hug from Kristen. Each one has a part, is part of the body of Christ, and are valuable members of the body of Christ. In the movie, The Miracle, about the 1980 men's hockey team, I don't know how many remember the miracle on ice in the 1980 Winter Olympics. The U.S. men's hockey team that was training, and their coach, Herb Brooks, wanted to put together a team that would beat the Soviets. In that film, Herb Brooks tells the general manager, Walter Bush, that he chose every member of that team for a specific purpose. He tells him, he goes on to say that he knew best what he needed to compete and the team he had chosen was it. He told the committee that hired him to coach the team that the key to success was taking individual talent, harnessing it, and focusing it for the betterment of the team. God in his sovereignty has composed a family here at Canyon Bible Fellowship. It is a family made up of individual members. Each of you, each of us, has different gifts different abilities, different interests, experiences, backgrounds. Yet God has brought each of us here now. I remember being asked as part of the candidating process what my plan for church growth was. I think my response was, I looked at, I think this was probably the Sunday that we had our fellowship time back in the uh, fellowship hall there. And I think my response was, I looked at everybody and I said, you're it. 
if you are a part of the body of Christ, if you are part of this particular family of believers, it is because God has determined that you have something to contribute. Something that I need and something that everyone else needs. God has also determined that we have something that you need. You and I are not called to sit idly by and watch others engage in ministry while you bury your talents. Neither are we called to be the body on our own, communicating through words or behaviors that we have no need for the rest of the body. We are called to humbly realize that the gifts we have received are things of grace given to us by the Holy Spirit. These are things that we possess now, not at some time in the future. Now is the time for us to realize that the members of the family have the responsibility to use their spiritual, their spirit-given abilities for the benefit of the family.